Hello and welcome to Great Lakes In Depth. I'm Rick Mixter, today with a look at one of the most interesting shipwrecks on the Great Lakes, the Sandusky. We'll find out how this incredible schooner ended up on the bottom and talk with the man who found the ship 125 years later. We'll also visit the Apostle Islands and take a look at the wrecks that are found there. All that in a creature close-up on a colorful and tasty yellow perch coming up on this edition of Great Lakes In Depth. Few shipwrecks are truly intact, that is, in one piece on the bottom that could be refloated and sailed. That's because a lot of the shallower wrecks are crushed by heavy ice, and the truly intact vessels that can be salvaged often are to sail again. The Sandusky is intact, and in a class all by itself. Images of the Straits of Mackinac usually bring up Michigan's icon, the giant Mackinac Bridge or Mackinac Island, where tourists find fudge and a relaxing bike ride where automobiles are not allowed. But for divers, the straits mean diverse diving. Here you will find schooners, steamships, and a lost modern style freighter. We find that the straits area preserved doesn't offer the clearest water uh, of any of the preserves, but we find that the straits offers a, one protection from weather. There's almost no day that you can't get out somewhere on one of the wrecks to dive. And it offers the largest variety of uh, ships that you'll find. We have uh, ships that run from a 600-foot modern uh, uh, steel freighter, just like you see sailing in the lakes today, to uh, old schooners that uh, sunk in the 1850s. Um, there are wrecks tend to be more intact, they're upright, and they're easy to dive. So. On one weekend in the Straits, you can dive on a steel freighter, you can dive on old wooden schooners, or you can dive on wooden uh, steamers from uh, the 1800s. The collection of shipwrecks and their varying depths make this area one of the Great Lakes' most visited dive preserves. And one of the most visited wrecks is the Sandusky. This film footage is the first ever on the Sandusky. Lost in a storm in 1856, the crew of seven would go down with the ship. Located by Chuck Feltner and his crew in 1981, the Sandusky is one of the most intact shipwrecks in the world. These images were from some 50 dives made in secrecy by the crew of the Gemini 2. Eager to keep salvage divers from plundering the wreck, the location remained secret for more than four years. By then, the wreck had been extensively cataloged. People that are generally interested in, uh, I think, maritime history and shipwrecks uh, certainly uh, like the, the sense of, well, what is that wreck like today? What, is, what does that ship look like on the bottom? Uh, we can tell them that through pictures, photographs, drawings, and verbal descriptions. It's a way to bring that wreck, or that ship, to life to people. The shipwreck is as close as you'll get to a pirate ship with its forward bowsprit and jib boom pointing out from the bow of the vessel, and its figurehead, which some say is a carving of a ram's head, located above the cutwater. Sadly, this unique figurehead was one of the first items to be targeted by thieves. A group of divers noted the item was loosened and recovered the original artifact. Now a replica remains beneath the waves, and the original was preserved by the state of Michigan. The theft of artifacts, including the ship's name board, upset many divers who enjoy exploring shipwrecks. Wood, for example, may survive perfectly underwater for a couple of hundred years, and after drying out maybe two days on the surface, it crumbles into nothing. You know, people will bring up an artifact thinking they've got a great find and it turns into junk, but then it's lost. They're not making any more of these. Divers will find several items unique to sailing ships, like these dead eyes. Looking like small faces carved from wood, the Dead Eye's purpose is to lock down ropes used to tighten sails. It was only discovered recently after laws have been enacted to help preserve the shipwrecks. As a result, when you dive it, you can find such normally uh, missing artifacts as dead eyes and the anchors are intact and uh, other, um, well, let's put it this way, other little trinkets and so on that just make diving a wreck like this so, so interesting. This you, one is so intact, you almost expect to see the sails on it down there, ready to go. It's, it's got everything for the, the Straits. This is one of the premier dive sites right here. The man who first saw the wreck agrees, and despite finding several of the shipwrecks in the Straits, the Sandusky is his favorite. The 
The Sandusky is deep, cold, and oftentimes cloudy, and probably best suited for the advanced diver. Exploring the deep, cold regions of the Great Lakes is sometimes unbearable and many times dangerous if you're not experienced or have the right equipment. Extensive research takes forever when your time on the bottom is limited to 30-minute windows of deep water exposure. So when shipwrecks are found in shallow water, investigators are excited about their ability to thoroughly document the find. Imagine the possibility of finding a wreck on the beach. Crossing Lake Michigan proved to be the Forester's final voyage in 1846. This is where it ended its journey, stranded on the beach near Naubenway, Michigan. Some 60 feet long, it's small when compared to the ships we're used to seeing on the Great Lakes, but it was an important jump in technology between the Native Americans' transportation and what we have today. This vessel, uh, the schooner design, uh, we believe it's a schooner, it could have been a brig. Um, those were uh, the next larger class of vessels, and those were used in the late period of the fur trade and the early exploration of, uh, of the lakes um, and settlement for fishing camps, uh, uh, timbering, um, trading, general trading, that sort of thing. So this is, this is the type of design that would have followed the canoes and the bateau, the small schooner. And as early as the 18th century, the British realized that the schooner and the sloop were the ideal rigs for sailing the Great Lakes. The, uh, the schooner and the sloop are both fore and aft rigged. They had the sort of triangular sails that you're familiar right. with on mm -hmm. modern sailboats. Uh, those are much handier in confined waters like the Great Lakes where you have variable winds and they can be handled with a smaller crew. And that's critical on the frontier where manpower is short and uh, money is short. So uh, you, hiring uh, extra personnel uh, can be difficult or, uh, or uneconomical. This wreck is among 100 known shipwrecks in the area, which is no surprise when you realize the traffic that Lake Michigan has had over the years. The Great Lakes were uh, an area of, of vast natural resources, uh, timber, coal, salt, um, the furs. Uh, after the timbering, uh, arable farmland and the grains, uh, the you know, sort of the breadbasket of the United States uh, that, uh, that developed out of the Great Lakes region. Um, and then later the discovery of iron ore and uh, copper ore. Uh, these, these were all uh, natural resources which were heavily exploited on the Great Lakes and the transportation that was offered by the waterway uh, uh, allowed those areas to be exploited. It allowed um, the communities to develop that we see around the Great Lakes. No, none of our major towns are anything but ports. Look at Chicago, Milwaukee, Detroit, Cleveland, Duluth, Buffalo. These are all port cities. And uh, then you consider the presence of the Mississippi River to the west. Mm -hmm. That connects us to the southern states and to the Gulf Coast. So the Great Lakes are sort of at the hub of this transportation network. Archaeologists uncovered the ship in 1990, then returned to the site three years later to catalog the cargo hold and keel area. Scraping away tons of beach sand, they found an intact hull. It's a shipwreck in the perfect place for preservation and investigation. Well, this vessel is interesting in uh, that it's such an intact craft. We're working it as a land site instead of an underwater site, so our technique can be a little more refined. Uh, we can work faster, we can recover more data um, in a, a shorter period of time. We've got unlimited visibility and unlimited time on this site. Usually I'm working with a, maybe a 30 minute bottom time, and I could see maybe as little as my, the length of my arm. Uh, I can't talk to my uh, co-workers. Uh, we can't have visitors come out and see the site and they stay on the surface and, uh, and interview us uh, and talk to us when we come out. But uh, it's, it's, it's made the archaeology a lot uh, easier and we're able to get 
uh, more kinds of information just because of the accessibility of having a ship on land. Sifting through the excavated sand, tiny artifacts are found that help identify the 62-foot-long sailor. Most believe it's the Forester, beached after a storm and then left on the beach. It was looted for years, locals taking what they could use from the stricken ship. The main deck was burned off to recover the iron nails and other fasteners, and we find a lot of charcoal on board. We find an odd assortment of fish bone that's probably come out of some of the barrels that had the had fish, salted fish in them. And this is, uh, these are a couple fragments of hoops, barrel hoops. Um, they're pretty delicate and they tend to fall apart. We find a lot of those in the bottom. And this other stuff is, these are just fragments of wood, barrel hoops and things like that. These pieces of limestone are likely a former cargo, but what was in the hold at the time of destruction is obvious. These buried barrels contained salted whitefish. We found several barrels that the heads had markings or names stenciled on them with uh, names of individual inspectors and also probably where some of the barrels were coming from, Syracuse, New York. And uh, those will give us an indication as to maybe when this ship went ashore, when this uh, cargo was loaded on board. Um, these, these individuals may have been only trading for a very short time, so we may be able to, to narrow down the date of the vessel loss. This season's catch is nothing like the items found in the first dig. Candlesticks, two tined forks, even decorated bowls were taken from the ship. We were here three years ago and excavated the forward cabin and the aft cabin, and we found uh, the crew's personal belongings, um, ship equipment, tools. It, it gives us an idea of how the crew lived and, and what they used in their daily lives. It's the personal items like this pipe that paint a picture of years gone by. It's a study of ourselves, and it, and it starts with, uh, with something like this, looking at the physical evidence of uh, the people who preceded us here. The, uh, the, modern, uh, the modern use of the lakes, the modern lumber industries, the commercial ore hauling, uh, the tourism recreation, uh, the farming, all of this grew out of the, uh, the, the 17th, 18th, 19th century European-American uh, sort of exploration, settlement, and development of the Great Lakes region. Dave says he isn't surprised that people were interested in the excavation, especially one that was where everyone could see it. There's been a lot of interest in maritime archaeology on the Great Lakes, maritime archaeology world over. People avidly read National Geographic and look at these fantastic excavations. But unless you dive, it's very difficult to see these sites. Uh, there's many sport divers on the Great Lakes who visit and enjoy uh, shipwrecks. The Millicoken site is an opportunity for non-divers to see that same part of our past. And you can see that here today with the, with the fascination of people. All of this careful digging turned up more clues on ship construction and life back in the 1800s. But archaeologists had to be a bit saddened when it was all filled back in again with sand. A near-perfect preservation material, the sand keeps oxygen away from decaying the wreck. So the forester will wait under tons of sand for the next team of archaeologists to unlock remaining secrets under the beach. The Apostle Islands are located in northern Wisconsin, almost at the western end of Lake Superior. It's a fantastic vacation area and even better diving. Poking just above the waves at Bayfield Harbor, the remains of the barge Finn McCool go largely unnoticed. It is one of the most intact shipwrecks in the area, in a protected spot of Lake Superior that survives a thick grinding ice that has reduced most of the Apostle Island wrecks to just pieces. Hidden just below the waterline are two decks, complete with the winches used to move heavy logs and other items onto and off of the Finn McCool. The normally clear visibility of Lake Superior was clouded by two days of rain before our visit, but the wreck allowed us diving when the other ships of the Apostles were unreachable. Located throughout an island chain in western Lake Superior, the wrecks here include the Mammoth Pretoria, 
the Savona, and the Lucerne, to name a few. The Finn McCool may not have a famous storm that brought it to the bottom, but it makes up for lack of history in its presentation. Lost with a load of logs in 1964, the ship had a long 40-year life before settling forever into the harbor. Private dock space makes access to the wreck difficult, as does the lack of diver information in the city. Bayfield is a far cry from Tobermory when it comes to dive tourism, despite incredible wrecks and a fantastic family atmosphere in the small Wisconsin town. Be sure to call ahead for a charter boat as most of the boats here are rigged for fishing and not for diving. But when you do find a charter boat, expect to spend the whole weekend. There's a lot to see in Bayfield, Wisconsin. The Yellow Perch is not only the star of many Friday night fish fries, it's also a wonderful addition to the creatures we see inside our Great Lakes. Yellow Perch are the most popular sport fish in Saginaw Bay, followed closely by the walleye. Uh, the annual catch by sport anglers of Yellow Perch from the bay is in the neighborhood of a million to a million and a half fish per year. Known for their golden color, the yellow perch is one of the most colorful of Great Lakes creatures. Yes, the yellow perch uh, typically are characterized by a golden or yellow uh, background marked with uh, darker, sometimes almost uh, iridescent green uh, bars that run down its sides. Uh, it has a medium-sized mouth. It uh, has very spiny dorsal and anal fins, again. Uh, typically will grow to a size of uh, eight to nine inches, although larger individuals are quite common. We, we see perch up to 12 or 13 inches out of Saginaw Bay upon occasion. It's not hard to find anglers in their minnow buckets during all times of the year, especially winter. And the shallow depth of these fish make ice fishing a safer sport on the bay. Uh, first ice yellow perch fishing is absolutely tremendous on Saginaw Bay. Uh, and uh, it doesn't require that anglers go to very deep water. Many good catches of perch are taken in two feet of water. Uh, ice fishing kind of tapers off as uh, the ice cover becomes more abundant uh, through the winter, but uh, people who stay after the perch can still get a mess of perch uh, uh, if they work for them. Then typically uh, the early spring fishery in April is again good. This is the time when the perch are spawning. Saginaw Bay is renowned for its yellow perch population and it's no surprise to see hundreds of anglers out here during the spring trying to catch this delicious fish. We'll be right back. Scuba diving was certainly made popular by Sea Hunt and the Jacques Cousteau specials, but unfortunately it made it seem like a male-dominated sport, and a lot of the equipment manufacturers followed suit and didn't design too many things for young children and women. All that has changed. This is not a macho sport. As a matter of fact, in Japan, more women dive than men do, although it's changing because, as I was told, where the women are, the men have a tendency to kind of go, and they're getting involved also. In the United States, about 40% of the divers are female. In the cooler climes where you do have to put on a little more equipment, um, we find a slightly less lower percent of women, although we have a lot of female customers who absolutely love shipwreck diving uh, down to a 100 foot level. And that's a little more sophisticated diving, both for men and women. Tom DeGroe teaches hundreds of divers how to breathe comfortably underwater. As an instructor, he knows the importance of matching gear to the individual. And that's important when choosing a buoyancy compensator or BC. What a buoyancy compensator does is it essentially allows you to adjust your buoyancy underwater so you're not too heavy and not too light. Uh, kind of like the ballast tanks of a submarine is how a buoyancy compensator works. You have to have a way of injecting air into a buoyancy compensator with a little power inflator or so. It can even be done orally. Once the buoyancy compensator gets to a certain level or volume and you're neutral, it's like being weightless. Mostly cut for men, the BC was hardly tailored for other divers, until now. What's unique about this particular buoyancy compensator is this was designed for women by 
Diving Women Engineers, Female Engineers. It's won many, many awards. It's the Sequest Diva QD. QD gets its name because, in fact, you don't need to wear a weight belt. Weights are added to pouches, put into the buoyancy compensator. There's no pulling around the waist or any rubbing on the hips. Weight belts can be up to 20 pounds, even more if you wear extra insulation. And it just feels better to get the weight off your hips and into a backpack. Tom found out that a good fit means more than just comfort for his female customers. When my wife tried this on the first time, she said she liked it better than other female buoyancy compensators that were on the market. It's designed for fit torso, you know, the woman's torso, woman's shape. I expected her to say she felt more comfortable in it, that she thought that no weight belt was a good idea, and her answer was, I feel more secure. And I looked at her flabbergasted. I've never heard a man say that, but I started thinking differently about how women perceive this particular sport. In our scuba classes, we have wetsuits that fit women. We have small tanks for smaller frames, be it men or women. But we certainly have three different styles of buoyancy compensators designed specifically for women, and the women really do enjoy them. It's more comfortable. Again, getting back to the comfort level, if you're comfortable, you're going to enjoy yourself. Like all sporting equipment, the BC and all the dive gear should be matched to the diver. It's more comfortable and safer as you explore underwater. We applaud those manufacturers who think of everyone when they design their gear. Now let's take a look at next week's show. Next week we'll go whale watching in the Great Lakes. These submarine-like vessels are called whale bags, and we'll take a look at one that's stranded on Lake Michigan. We'll also dive the Diluti near Marquette and take a look at a native fish that has anglers traveling far out in Lake Superior to try and catch them. All coming up on next week's Great Lakes In Depth. Well, that's about it for this week's show. I'm Rick Mixter. Thanks for taking an in-depth look beneath our wonderful Great Lakes. We'll see you next week.